Uh, Ravi Shankar here, and I'm, I'm about to read a poem, and actually uh, this is on the, the day after the election, so it's a, kind of an appropriate poem, and it might be time for us to reconsider the Electoral College uh, and some of the rudiments and founding principles that were passed on by brilliant men who were nonetheless flawed. And uh, this poem comes from a, a commission that I had to write a poem about Thomas Jefferson. Just so happened I, I went to high school at Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology, and then I went to the University of Virginia, which is a university designed by Jefferson. And so um, I got this commission, but I just so happened that I was in Nepal when I got this invitation and, I, and the deadline was soon after. And so I had to work on this poem while I was walking around the streets of Kathmandu. And uh, the disjunction of that, I think in part gave rise to this poem. A um, couple of things I'll mention. Uh, there are uh, the names of a few Himalayan gods. I think that um, contextually be able to, to figure them out. And uh, the poem is also in the form of Terza Rima, which is, uh, of course, a form popularized by Dante. Um, but um, it's in Tercets, um, where the last word of the first line and the last word of the third line rhyme, and then the, that last word of the middle line becomes the, the rhyme for the next first and third. So it's a kind of interwoven uh, form. So this is Thomas Jefferson in Kathmandu and uh, has a little epigraph from Jefferson's preamble to a, a bill for the more general diffusion of knowledge from 1778. Experience has shown that even under the best forms of government, those entrusted with power have in time and by slow operations perverted it into tyranny. TJ and Kathmandu. Packed in thamel into a beat up tempo, that minivan which serves as public transportation in Nepal, I'm thumbing your visage on a nickel near the tan faces of seekers and trekkers, the various people of foreign descent who throng the dusty road in saffron shirts and rudakrasha malas. The steeple up ahead really is stupa, where we stop to unload passengers and accept others. Here I think of you, TJ, in the faux Gilbert Stuart portrait that stood smelling of agar from Petri dishes, plus an old gym shoe odor that never seemed to dissipate from the halls of my high school, named for you, where I went through facial hair, trigonometry, punk rock, soccer, SATs, angst, in short, the whole gamut of adolescent failure and triumph. Now, standing in front of stalls selling Himalayan masks, frozen in poses of pent up animal rage and wood carved rictuses of wrath, I remember how many long hours I once spent under your unnoticed gaze working on some math problem or pining over the redhead I was smitten with, carrying my dog-eared copy of Sylvia Plath, dreaming myself a writer before I'd even written one stanza worth rereading. It would be much later at the university you built where I'd be bitten by the bug properly, a sensation made ever greater in the walks I would take, traversing your serpentine walls alone at home in my mind, the way a crater gives shape to a surface by suggesting what's unseen, what might have once been still yet what is to come. I trace the rim of my own unknowing, still so green but ambitious, questioning everything, trying to shun nothing, striking together stones to make a fire that would burn brighter and deeper than a twinning sun. Here now is Chittapati, the skeletal lord of the funeral pyre, and Mahakala, the great black one, personal tutelary of Kublai Khan, with flared nostrils, bared fangs, and ire to spare. And here you are on your plantation, Mulberry Row, where slaves worked as smiths, joiners, weavers, carpenters, and hustlers, each of whom has a story untold on unmarked graves or in your writing. Grievers mourned your death on Independence Day, but of them, what? Here I am at Alderman Library, working levers of the elevator, moving in half-floor slowest phlegm, seeping down a basin drain. 
Here you are in Paris wearing yarn stockings, velveteen breeches, the exquisite hem of your waistcoat like wild honeysuckle bearing subtle blossom. Here are all the dark bodies going into ground after a lifetime of labor, and you staring from Mount Rushmore, me from under the flowing rim of the Annapurna Mountains. Here are the Bill of Rights where Sally Hemings does her light sewing. I'm on the other side of the world and still can't see clearly what has succeeded and what has failed in the grand American experiment. I eat my fill, no prayer bowl to beg from, yet have been jailed and bailed out, slurred, even refused service at a diner 250 years after you were born. I know I'm not nailed to a cross, but why is it I feel so much finer and more contented in a country ruled by Maoists and Marxists than I do in the democratic designer shining city on the hill where all the Taoists, Hindus, and Buddhists I'm meeting want to move to regardless? to start new lives in the USA. How is it possible that the Nuari dancer's ancient groove feels more timely than twerking, that I'd rather eat dosas and dal than haute cuisine? No need to prove an answer to those questions as they're mine to read and puzzle out, but grown from a seed planted at your plantation into a towering crop, I now need heed. Democracy is a fine ideal yet to be supplanted, but can it coexist with capitalism? Today, I was told a Nepalese proverb, which might be loosely translated as cumin in an elephant's mouth, meaning how all the gold in the world shines valueless next to our own nothingness, how the priceless figs we hunger for are impossible to be bought or sold. I've secreted the nickel now in the folds of a torn sari a woman with child uses to collect rupees. She is our mother from another life and you and I are no less, no more than brothers. If even in this late hour, honesty is the first chapter in the book of wisdom, then its epilogue must be compassion, not power.